Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our event on menopause and heart disease and looking after your heart health. Now, as you have seen from the invitation to this event, many of us believe that the greatest risk to our health is breast cancer. But women in the UK are actually around twice as likely to die from cardiovascular disease or CVD. And our risk increases after the menopause when we experience changes to our blood vessels, cholesterol and blood pressure, all of which are risk factors for CVD. And that's why the theme for this year's World Menopause Day is heart health. And that's why it's such an important one for us to talk about. Now, Dr. Claire and I believe that knowledge is empowering. And that's why we're delighted to be joined by two brilliant experts where we'll discuss why our risk of heart disease increases post-menopause and what we can do about it. We're joined this evening by Nigel Denby. Nigel is an award-winning registered dietitian and founder of the 40,000 strong menopause support community, Harley Street at Home. And he's over 20 years of experience in helping to women to eat better. Mel Berry is the co-founder of Her Spirit. And she also has over 20 years of working in the sports and physical activity sector. And her passion for getting the best out of herself and everyone she works with is really what drives Mel every day. And it's one of the reasons why she set up her spirit alongside her co-founder, Holly. So if you, as ever, put your questions into the chat, we'll either pick them up through the conversation this evening or we'll take them at the end. Um, and I'm sure you'll appreciate that the team here won't be able to answer individual specific medical queries, but they can, of course, respond on a broad level. So the first question I'm going to put to is to Dr. Claire my brilliant co-founder of my menopause center and expert in all things menopause. Claire, why don't we start off with covering the basics? If you could just help us to understand what cardiovascular disease is. Yes, thank you, Helen. And good evening, everybody. It's great to see so many faces this evening. So cardiovascular disease or heart disease is a really broad spectrum umbrella term that includes coronary artery disease, now, coronary artery disease is where the blood vessels that supply the muscle, the bulk of the heart, get a little bit narrowed, can get clogged up, and that can lead to heart attacks. It can lead to angina, um, and it's also a factor in the development of, card con of congestive heart failure, which is also another type of heart disease. So congestive heart failure is where the pump doesn't pump as efficiently as it could do. Um, and then that can be, uh, that can lead to fluid. I'm oh, sorry, the, I think um, there might be reverb or if everybody makes sure they're on um, mute. Um, thank you so much. Um, but it can lead to buildup of fluid in the lungs and on the ankles. Um, and then of course there's mini strokes, TIA, transient ischemic attacks and strokes where there are blockages, partial blockages in the blood vessels supplying the brain. Um, and then there's peripheral vascular disease, and that's where the arteries in your usually legs get clogged up also, but it can also affect the um, arteries supplying the gut or even the arms. So um, it's sort of wide ranging in its reach. So although we use cardiovascular disease as a single term, we actually mean quite a broad spectrum of different disease processes. And then what, what actually causes heart disease or a CVD clear? Yeah, so it usually there isn't like one exact cause and usually it's a combination of risk factors. So high blood pressure is an incredibly important risk factor or cause um, because that, if your blood pressure is high, it's putting strain on the whole system. It's causing damage to those blood vessels and damage can lead to clots forming on the damaged bit, which can lead to blockages. So an increase in what we call your LDL cholesterol, that's the cholesterol with the tiny little particles because the little particles um, clog up vessels more easily than the bigger particles that get brushed along in the bloodstream. Diabetes, smoking, obesity is a big one and on the increase, unhealthy diet, which I know Nigel will talk about in a little while. Lack of physical exercise, which Mel's going to talk to us about. But I think what's also interesting to think about in women is the long-term effect of chronic stress and anxiety, 
I think we're increasingly recognizing domestic stress and domestic violence and pressure um, can all take its toll. And there are illnesses where you sort of exist in more of an inflamed, your body is in more of an inflamed state, like, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. There are increasing reproductive factors, which I won't go into now, but um, so starting periods earlier, having high blood pressure in pregnancy, we're increasingly recognizing can all increase the risk of heart disease. And Claire, when we first started working together in my menopause centre, as, as a lay person, one of the things that really surprised me was just how much the risk of heart disease increases for women post-menopause. It's, it's something that had never crossed my mind. I just, probably like many women, worked in the assumption that women were less likely to get heart disease than men. So wh what are the changes that happen in our body post-menopause that lead to more women being at risk of heart disease? Yeah, that's a really good point to pull out, Helen. So it's really fascinating. Before the menopause, women's risk of heart disease is lower that of men's. And then they swap over when you've been through the menopause. And that's because estrogen is protective on the cardiovascular system. And so estrogen helps keep those bad cholesterol tiny particles low. It helps keep our blood vessels elastic and able to stretch and come back down again. Um, and it can also help um, with our metabolism of carbohydrate and prevent something called insulin resistance. It's a bit complicated, but when you lose estrogen, we are more prone to put fat on round the middle, that really awful term middle age spread. Um, and the, 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 the fat around your middle increases your risk of something called insulin resistance, where we don't handle carbohydrates in quite the same way more extra carbs are turned into fat, and that in itself can also increase the risk of heart disease. So many factors. And then you add on the fact that, you know, we're maybe not sleeping so well, we're maybe not making the right choices in terms of diet and exercise because of the impact of other menopause symptoms also. So again, lots of different interplaying factors that add to an increase in risk. And then last question before we um, come on to Nigel. So I've seen a lot of different headlines in the papers around um, these are the signs of heart disease. The signs of heart disease differ for men compared to women. It's really important, you know, for everyone on the call to leave this evening with an understanding of what are the signs of heart disease. So if you could just maybe talk us through that so people know if they or a loved one or a friend or a colleague at work are experiencing certain symptoms that they might be at risk of, 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 of a heart attack? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a good question. So um, symptoms of a heart attack itself, and for some angina will start like this, a sort of chest tightness, the pain in the chest might go up to your neck, to your jaw, might go down your arm. Um, but it's quite interesting. So both women and men experience, do experience the same symptoms, but women are more likely to have atypical symptoms like indigestion. So I can vividly remember a friend telling me about her mother who had a heart attack and she just thought it was indigestion. And luckily with a medical daughter, put two and two together, got her to hospital and it was a heart attack. So women can have atypical chest pain, <clears throat> They may have more shortness of breath. They may feel more fatigued, more ex experiencing sort of weakness and having a more of an indigestion type pain rather than the advert that you maybe see on the TV, which is the man with the um, horrible wires stretching across the chest. But we also know that women behave differently. So women may delay seeking care, say delay seeking health care, and there's also higher levels of denial of symptom recognition. So just thinking, oh, it's fine, it's fine. It's just a bit of indigestion. Women are less likely to immediately seek help than men. So we know that's why, you know, some of the figures for mortality are worse for women than they are for men. Again, because of those um, tricky factors that it's so important that we recognize yeah. these symptoms and ask for help. I think that's probably a key message take out from you Claire isn't it to, because we we hear this so often and all of the you know I'm sure you hear it from patients but we hear it a lot in these types of webinars that we do we hear it a lot from friends to go my symptoms aren't bad enough to do something about it and you kind of go well how bad do you need to feel before you think you're worth it so I think there is something about don't be embarrassed to go to your doctor or to call up 
if you think there might be a slight risk. And I sometimes wonder if the kind of the 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 kind of mindset of I'll just battle through this, I'll plow on and I'll be fine. I've got to look after everybody else. You've kind of got to put yourself first here, don't you? No, I think that's absolutely right. And I think the that message needs to get through that you you know, even if you phone a GP surgery, it will say if you're experiencing chest pain, phone 999. Well, you might be experiencing a tightness or a indigestion mm -hmm. or a just not quite right. So, yeah, it, it's important to recognize. And the I'll send you a link. The British Heart Foundation have really good, really clear guidance on symptoms and what to look out for. So I will send that across to put in the chat. Super. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll post some links in the chat about um you know, about heart disease symptoms, et cetera. So if you keep an eye out for them in, in a moment. Now, Nigel, um, Claire touched on one of the really uh, critical things that can, you know, make managing one's health really challenging for women as they go through through menopause. So you, you've so much experience in this in, in this area. What, what's your kind of advice and, and take out in terms of what women can do from a nutritional perspective to manage their health for heart health and for general good health? Well, absolutely. Thanks, Helen. It, it really does. The two go hand in hand, essentially. You don't need to follow a special diet for heart health and another special diet for managing your weight and another one for menopause and another one for bone health. They all work really well together. As Claire mentioned, we know at least half, more like three quarters of women will be gaining weight through their perimenopause journey. And the majority of that weight is all going to accumulate around that middle section. So ladies, you know, you may well feel nothing's changed in your life, but suddenly your bra doesn't fit, your jackets don't fit, your shirts don't fit in the way that they did. Um, and that is this central um, uh, collection of, of new um, adipose or fat tissue that is largely happening because your estrogen levels are reducing, estrogen, that gift that keeps giving at, at perimenopause, and your metabolic rate is slowing down through the loss of muscle tissue. Now, the good thing is that you can, I absolutely guarantee to you, it is tough and it's harder than it was when it was when you were 30, but you can reverse that and you absolutely can take some really significant steps to reducing your risk of cardiovascular disease. The large proportion, a large proportion of your risk is preventable. You cannot do anything about your age. You can't do anything about your stage of life that you're at. And you can't do things about your genetics. But the things that you can do that will really make a difference are right under your nose. These are not, uh, this is not rocket science. This is simple, healthy um, uh, living and eating. So first thing is, Claire mentioned cholesterol. You've got to go and get your cholesterol checked. We see a direct increase in cholesterol levels for the majority of women going into perimenopause and menopause. You don't just want to look at your total cholesterol. You really want to understand the ratio of um, HDL, that's the good protected, well, not exactly protected, but the good cholesterol versus that bad um, LDL cholesterol. So understand the ratio and make sure that you know which one is, if they're elevated, which one is elevated. Then you can take some really useful steps to reduce that, uh, to change that. So the first thing you can do is if you notice that you're overweight or that you've gained, even if you're not classed as overweight, but you've gained this central weight around your tummy, that's going to be having a big impact on your risk. And if you can reduce your weight by a minimum of 10%, it's not a huge amount, um, that is going to have a massive impact on your overall cardiovascular risk, but also your cholesterol levels. If you are finding that your cholesterol levels are high, um, you might immediately think about a statin, and you can go and buy a statin over the counter, although Dr. Claire can also prescribe it to you. I would suggest before you even think about doing that, look at your diet first for about three months. And there are some really good things that you can do. The first thing you can look at is introducing some plant stanols and sterols. These are the things you find in Benacol, Flora Proactive. The best way 
to get the most effective dose of plant stanols is to take the little yogurt drink that gives you two grams of the active ingredient every day um, uh, as part of your breakfast. And the latest evidence is showing that that alone can have a similar effect to taking a statin in just two to three weeks. You have to keep taking that stanol, that little yogurt drink every day to maintain that effect. So it may be that you don't even need to introduce another medication into the mix to, to manage your cholesterol. Other things that are great, grazing on some things like almonds. Almonds contain a little compound, about 25 grams of almonds is a terrific snack for the day. More soluble fiber from particularly, from lots of different fruits, veg and pulses, but particularly from oats. So you might even start to see here, you could have a little cholesterol lowering shake in the morning. Chuck in your Benacol drink, a handful of almonds, a load of porridge oats, top that up with some soya milk, about 200 millilitres of soya milk, and then some fruit, whiz that up in a blender, and you have what we call a portfolio diet cholesterol lowering shake. The type of fibre you'll get in the oats, I didn't mention, it's called beta-glucan. It's like wallpaper paste. It goes around your body, picking up the nasty cholesterol and taking that out. Other simple things, though, again, that would fit into a weight loss regime, a general health regime, and all particularly a cardiovascular health regime. More fish. That's a minimum of two servings a week, a serving being about the size of the palm of your hand. We want to see one serving of white fish, cod, hake, something like that. Another one of oily fish, salmon tuna, pilchards, sardines, not, did I say tuna? Not tuna. So salmon, uh, trout, um, sardines, pilchards, um, mackerel. Tuna doesn't contain enough omega-3 to count as one of these oily fish that we really need. It's the omega-3s that we're looking for. Really, really useful. And that one serving a day, a, a week will give you those. The other things, again, I've told you these are simple, simple things, fruit and veg, loaded with antioxidants. These are protective vitamins and minerals, five servings a day. And forgive me if I'm telling you things you think you know, we all know this. The average consumption in the UK is three servings a day. So we know it, we're not doing it. Let's turn this into action. And if you are achieving five a day, make it a rainbow of different colors. Those colors will give you the biggest mix of antioxidants that you can have. The other thing they'll do is more soluble fiber, like the type of fiber in the oats. They'll keep you feeling fuller for longer and they will really enable you uh, to manage your weight. Again, I just want to emphasize, you don't need keto diets, you don't need intermittent fasting, you don't need anything like a maple syrup diet or anything else that's coming out of California at the moment. None of those things are necessary and you don't really need to take a medication to manage your weight. So don't worry about trying to access injections like all the celebs are on the telly. You don't need these things. The reason the UK is one of the fattest nations on the earth is because we don't eat enough fruit and veg, we eat too much fat, we don't, we drink too much booze, and we don't move enough. And on that, I'll hand over to Mel, because I think Mel is going to bring the other part of the jigsaw together. Helen, forgive me, that's your job, handing over no, to No, 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 that, that, that's great. I just wonder if we could take um, one question, Nigel. A few, yeah. a few great questions have come in, and I think one might be very timely as we're talking about nutrition yes, here. There's a great question from Jane um, where she said her GP said she had a good ratio of HDL to LDL, but high LDL. And when she was asked how to address the high LDL, it was suggested she stop eating sausage and meat, diet, uh, meat pies, but she has a plant based diet. So that wasn't helpful. So what would your advice be, Nigel? Yeah, the old days we used to when I trained, we were taught not to eat eggs and not to eat shellfish. And that would be, keep your cholesterol under control because those foods contain cholesterol. 
foods that contain cholesterol don't have really any impact on the cholesterol in your blood. The thing that does is if you, uh, from your diet, is if you eat lots and lots of saturated fat. But look, most of the ladies here are bright, they're well informed, they've probably been cutting down their saturated fat for years. I bet there's nobody in the audience who drinks full fat milk or sits and loads on the butter every day, fries in lard or eats the fat off their pork chop. You've not been doing that for years. The reason most of us have high dodgy cholesterol is the fact that our liver produces more than we need. That's the issue. And what we do know about diet is those foods I outlined to you, the almonds, the oats, the soya and the plant stanols. Actually, when it comes to diet, your diet has far more power in reducing bad cholesterol than it does in contributing to bad cholesterol. So if you think your diet is relatively good, focus on bringing more of the stuff in that is going to help lower it rather than th beating yourself up thinking it's what you've done. You haven't given yourself this situation. Brilliant. Thank you, Nigel. And Emma and Mariella, we've clocked your questions and we're going to come back to them at the end. So don't, don't worry, we, we, we will pick them up. So Mel, Nigel teed you up beautifully. So the other part of the lifestyle equation, the biggie, exercise. Yeah, so thank you, Nigel. And um, I know the first time we met, I loved you and I love you even more by so much that you, you talked about. So, yeah, it's a, a great way of getting women to eat sensibly. So from an activity point of view, I guess let's look at a couple of stats in the in the UK. Nearly half of the female population are inactive. So 40 percent of women in the UK are inactive. And just give people a little bit of context on that. So if you go and see someone like the wonderful Dr. Claire, she'll say that you be, need to be doing 150 minutes of heart raising activity and two strength training sessions. And I'll come on to kind of both of those. But when we talk about 150 minutes, people go, oh, my God, there's no way that I can do that. That just sounds so much. The important thing is about repetition. So we would suggest 30 minutes every day. And most importantly, and to everybody on the, this um, call is find something that you love, because if you love it, you're going to probably do it and you're going to probably thrive um, through that. If you go back to those 150 minutes, heart raising activity means that you need to be out of breath, but you don't get to the point where you can't hold a conversation with somebody. You're probably starting to feel that you're sweating a little bit. Um, but again, that's that kind of heart ticking. And I know that, Helen, you post that British Heart Foundation kind of link. I guess, again, the important things that people need to kind of realise is it lowers your blood pressure. So that's really important for, the, obviously, everything that we're talking about tonight. You're obviously reducing your heart rate. So you have a lower heart, a resting heart rate, which is really important thing to do. Cholesterol, obviously, Nigel's talked about that, obviously, from a food point of view, and obviously ex activity also has that. And again, type two um, diabetes. So there are many reasons why you should, and it's really important thing. And I think one thing that we need to remember is physical activity is great for your physical health, but I'm a massive advocate in terms of your, your mental health. And for us at Her Spirit, we're about inspiring women to be more active, but at the same time, improving their mental health as well as their kind of nutritional health. So, yeah, find something you love. And those are kind of some of the, I guess, the baselines that help to give you an idea of am I doing enough and what do I need to do? And, and Mel, and, and, and this is a question for you and Nigel, because and, and, and you've touched on this um, very often. We kind of know what we need to do. But changing our behavior is kind of easier said than done. So what what advice would you give everyone to, to think about how you, it's that inertia, how do you get over the inertia or how do you find the the kind of the willpower to, to start on the journey at least? Yeah, look, I think that um, doing it with others and a community for us at Her Spirit, our community is everything. It's our heartbeat. It gives women that opportunity to be supported. So if you don't know about us, uh, we enable women to be able to access content through our app, which means that you can get everything from 
indoor cycling, strength training, and I'll come back to that in a second. But I guess it gives you that strength of the power of the the female collective that when you don't feel that you can do something or want to do something, you're ordinarily going to get somebody going, come on, you can do it. And I would always say that when you do something, you never regret it because you feel better for it. So what should I be doing? Things like walking, running, swimming, cycling are really good things to then be able to do. But I think one of the, the areas, it's an area we're really passionate about and why we develop what we call couch to kilos is strength training because people look at strength training and go, that's not going to get my heart rate up. Trust me that when you then start to do strength training, it's a really important thing. And uh, Nigel, we talked about this earlier in the in the week. When you strength train, and I'm one of them, um, you increase your ability to get testosterone. And again, a lot from a, from a hormonal point of view. Me, I struggled down that journey of losing muscle. So it's a great thing to do. And I guess, you know, we hope to make it easy. So when you don't know what to do in the gym or you don't know what to do in some of the... We give you coach-led experiences, which again, make it a really amazing thing to do. And in our language, we would love you to be fitter, stronger and healthier because, hey, you get on a journey of self-discovery and achieve things that you never thought possible. Yeah, look, that that's really inspiring, Mel. And I know from the brilliant work that you and Holly do, you really are changing women's lives. Um, And, I, and I've learned myself, I, I, I would say, you know, I never exercised really or worked out till I was about 52, 53, but I'm definitely the fittest now I've ever been. And I only wish I could go back in time to, to say to my younger self, and it's not it's not just for physical well-being, it's for my mental well-being, as you say, it does make a huge, a huge difference. Yeah, um, and it's just connectivity with, you know, um, other women, um, Helen, you know, we've got um, women across the UK and I told a very, you know, wonderful story we support it's Sheila she's 66 she unfortunately lost her, her daughter um, two years ago but we come and support uh, and help you and I would say to everybody on this call I guarantee you won't regret being active or being a bit more active and I, and you won't regret being part of the Her Spirit community because you will see people like you and people will lift you up and support you, um, you know, kind of on that journey. And like you and Claire, Helen, knowledge is power. We want to give you that ability to understand your why. Well, why do I do that? That's really important. We give you inspiration because we show you others that are doing the same thing. That's the power of the community. And then we give you that um, guidance. So there are so many things that we just kind of spoke about. We have monthly challenges. The challenge at the moment is to walk or run 31 miles. I'm walking it because I've got an osteoarthritic hip um, and 180 minutes of kind of yoga. So I'm getting into that. So, yeah, challenges. Um, and look, I guess we, we're in the motivation game when I hope that we've motivated so many of you today through myself, Nigel, obviously yourself, Helen and Claire. Yeah, and I'm smiling, Mel, um, because Rachel uh, just put a, 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 a message in here. She said her trainer said to her, we're training for our old lady bodies, not our beach bodies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, but it can be our old lady beach bodies too, you know. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, Nigel, um, what, what advice would you give people to just get on the journey of, you know, that those incremental changes that really all add up to making a difference? How do you get over that inertia and, and kind of years of habits? Similar approach, I think, you know, I'm not a big fan of willpower, to be honest. I think what you what women are brilliant at doing much better than men is planning and actually working out what needs to be done and um, how they're going to do it. Um, and that's really where you start when it comes to your diet. What I think you've got to do it goes back to that thing of it being right under your nose. Keep a food um, uh, and activity diary for a few days. Really be honest with that. Take a look at it um, and then start to imagine you were advising your best mate or your daughter uh, and have a look at that diary and see what you think the big wins would be. It might be to do with things like grazing between meals. It might be portion size. It might be a balance of food groups. Maybe there is no food, fruit and veg there. Maybe you don't cook anything from scratch and it's all takeaways and being bought in. You'll know straight away when you start seeing what you wouldn't really feel very keen to admit to a, another group of women. Those will be the things that need to change and take them in 
one at a time and really work out what you're going to do. It's all very well saying I need to eat more fruit and veg. Utterly meaningless unless you get down to how are you going to do that? What is meaningful is to say, I'm going to have a glass of juice with my breakfast. I'm going to have one snack a day that is a piece of fruit. And I'm going to have an extra serving of veg with every evening meal that I have. Suddenly, you've gone up by three a day. You do that with every part of the diet that you want to change. And soon that starts to become a lifestyle plan, not a diet. Diets, you know, diets is a horrible word. It has an inherently has an end point. There is no time to waste in perimenopause on diets. What you need is a lifelong lifestyle plan. You are going to be menopausal for the rest of your life. So whatever you do to maintain your weight, to maintain your health at perimenopause, you will still need to be doing when you're 95. Yeah, like Mel and Nigel, that is absolutely fantastic advice and so pragmatic. And you're not asking people to write a check for hundreds of pounds or whatever to to do that you're talking about, you know, those Shalina, as you're saying, the baby steps that we can take to really make those big changes. So that that's really resonated. Now, Claire, back to you for a few questions um, and we'll pick up on some of the questions that have come through in, in the chat for you, too. Um, and, and I know you're a big advocate of lifestyle changes as the foundation for, for good health and for um, for health span as well as lifespan. Um, but we get a lot of questions around the role of hormone replacement therapy or HRT. Um, and, you know, we often get questions around, should I take HRT for heart health? So what what what, what should we know about HRT, the menopause transition and heart health? Yeah, no, it's a really good question that we get asked a lot. So the first thing to say is, you know, just to sort of second what both Mel and Nigel have said, I speak to so many women in this sort of quagmire of the menopause with brain fog, feeling rubbish, low self-esteem, et cetera. And it's making those small, realistic, so if you, you know, it, sometimes you just need to make really small steps um, to start to make changes as both um, Nigel and Mel have said. And HRT, can really help with that. If the, if the HRT can help manage some of those symptoms of the menopause that are just holding you back, if your mood is improved, if the anxiety is diminished, um, then it can help you make those right decisions or help just adding an extra piece of fruit in the afternoon, which may seem like a really big thing to get your brain around when you're thinking, ah, too much going on. So, but just in terms of HRT to directly support reducing the risk of heart disease, it's a tiny bit more complicated. So we know if you start HRT within 10 years of the menopause, that's within 10 years of your last period or under the age of 60, then you probably reduce your risk of heart disease by upwards of 24%. And we know there's really good data showing overall reduction in the risk of dying from heart disease as a result of taking HRT by around 30%. Um, but we don't have the data to know whether it's the right thing to take HRT for primary prevention of heart disease. So at the moment, the recommendation is that take HRT if you've got menopause symptoms and we know that you reduce your risks. But what we don't know is if that benefit so outweighs any of the small risks that it is right to say take it to prevent um, any risk of heart disease in total. So if you look at the British Menopause Society guidance, if you look at the International Menopause Society advidance, the guidance is take HRT for symptom control, but the positive knock-on effect also is it can reduce risk by giving enough estrogen back, which you know we know can prevent buildups in little arteries. We know it can get, well, it can marginally help cholesterol, but again, you wouldn't take HRT to reduce your cholesterol. We know you can marginally reduce your blood pressure with HRT, but you wouldn't take it as a blood pressure treatment. Nigel, do you want to come in and add? Yeah. Oh, well, I was going to add there, Claire, um, and I'm sure Mel would be in the same position. It's absolutely behind you. 
ladies, you've got to look at this from, from sort of three different angles. If you are on your knees with the menopause, don't start trying to change your diet and get into activity at that point. You've got to start feeling better first. Mm. And then the rest can come. But the message from us, I don't think Mel or I would ever suggest diet and lifestyle is going to be all of your menopause symptoms. It won't do that for you. But what it will do is anything you do with Dr. Claire to manage your symptoms, it will amplify the benefit of that tenfold it's the thing that the the exercise and the diet once you've got your treatment the way you want to treat your your menopause whether that's with hrt or not but what, once you've got that plan it this bit the lifestyle bit is the thing that is the difference between th thriving or just kind of surviving through it yeah, and I'd echo your thoughts. And I think one of the things, and Claire, I know we've had lots of these conversations, is many people think that HRT is the magic bullet and, and that for some people it doesn't help or doesn't work. But if you are active, reduce your alcohol consumption and you look at the diet that you're consuming, all of that mixture is going to enable you to still be your, your best self. And, you know, I know, you know, my personal kind of journey on that are, 100 percent you know that and it's identifying what helps you to be your best self uh, yeah no i think that's right and so that's why we work so brilliantly together because we both send women in both directions don't we i am often advising um patients that i'm helping manage through their menopause to to her spirit to nigel holly street at home because we've got great HRT I can get the HRT and tweak it so no side effects it's doing what you need but there's still that missing bit you still maybe need to move a little bit more you still need to maybe look at diet because we know that you oh you feel so much better um from for many women from um attacking a diet looking at your balance as Nigel said so yeah it's it's great that we're all talking together this evening because it is so important to have a holistic round approach don't you think one of the hard bits of this as well is that you know the reason cardiovascular disease is almost the ugly sister of menopause you know we give lots and lots of spotlight and attention to some of the female cancers don't we mm. the, the issue here is apart from the fact that we always thought think about this as a man's disease there's nothing to see so many of these issues you can't see those arteries clogging up you don't necessarily even know you've got high blood pressure um but, you know, again, the thing to get over it is if you know that you have got that that little bit of that middle age spread, as Claire explained, that sort of 10 kilos going on your tummy, pretty much you can take it that you are therefore going to be at an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. I was looking at some studies this week and they were literally telling us that at perimenopause, we reckon 40% of women are living with some kind of cardiovascular risk. And by the time we get to menopause, that has nearly doubled to 70%. Now that might not necessarily, you might not feel anything, but it starts to give some reality to the fact that that's why more women die of cardiovascular disease than pretty much anything else, because more women are living with it. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point to pull out. As sobering as it is, you know, it is yeah. the leading cause of death worldwide. And I read a statistic the other day that pulled me up short that 50% of women at 60 have got hypertension and a lot of that is undiagnosed. So look, the great thing about all of this, folks, is you can do something about it. Mm. You can check your blood pressure. You can speak to your doctor or healthcare professional, practice nurse, and, you know, these are all modifiable risk factors that you can do something about. So, yeah, that's and I think, a take home message. Yeah, picking up on your point, Helen, it's not too late. You got yeah. to a time in your life where 
I guess you opened your eyes and said, wow, this is something that has enabled me to thrive. I feel great. And uh, you have. So, yeah, look, I guess my synopsis is small steps leading to big changes. It's about lifestyle. It's about movement. We're a very sedentary country. So, again, if you think I don't have time, why don't you walk to somewhere and, and actually just keep moving? Because that's really important for your cardiovascular health as well. We've got some really brilliant questions coming through. A um, couple on HRT, um, a couple on, which I'm going to start on, which really touch on health inequalities, Claire. Mm. Um, and we, we know that, you know, with all of the research that you alluded to that's been done to show, you know, um, women don't necessarily have different symptoms, but the, there's, a, there's a real challenge in terms of the health inequalities with how women are heard and listened to. So mm. there's a brilliant question here from Emma. Um, how do we get healthcare professionals to take symptoms seriously um, if we do seek advice for tightness or in, in indigestion? Yeah, I think um, you, so it's really difficult. It's really hard. You just want your GP to listen to you. And so I think it it's going prepared with your list of symptoms. And just if they don't bring up heart disease because, you know, they may not think of that immediately for whatever reason, you know, don't be afraid to say, how do I know that this is not heart disease? Are there tests that I can have? You know, GPs do not mind. You might be number 17 in a list of eight, you know, a number of patients at 10 minute intervals. And and I never and I always, always say, please don't be afraid to challenge your GP and to just nudge them into thinking down the line that you would be thinking of. A, you know, a GP should say, were you think what were you thinking of particularly? But you know, if they don't tell them, don't be afraid to tell them. Be, you know, sad, as sad as it is, sometimes you do have to be your own advocate and yeah. Uh, don't be afraid it is that because you're worth it isn't it you've, you've got to kind of back yourself when you're when you're yeah. going into those um conversations and mariella has mentioned here because you've, you've touched upon you know, the importance of understanding your cholesterol level your blood pressure etc um mariella's experience unfortunately was that she asked her gp for a cholesterol test because she did an early menopause at 31 she's now 64 and they said she'd have to pay for it privately i, I have to say I've, I've never heard that is that that is kind of shocking isn't it that it's it atypical shopping? there, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. I I like to think that that isn't typical, and I'm so sorry that you've had that experience. You know, if if you had a cholesterol test six months ago, yes, your GP may say just wait um, a year because it's unlikely to have changed. But I'm really sorry that you've had that experience. You know, there are well woman che checks now that everybody's invited to at certain decades and uh, different ages. So you should be able to go and have a health check at your GP practice. Out of curiosity, how often should we be getting our blood pressure and cholesterol checked without overloading the NHS? We, we know it's it's very under a lot of pressure at the moment, but what's a sensible level of, of checking to do? Yeah, it depends. So if you know that you've got a high cholesterol, you might need to check it annually. But if your cholesterol is really low and there's been no changes, you maybe wouldn't need to check it annually. Blood pressure, some people get obsessed by measuring their blood pressure. They buy a monitor and they come with like lists and lists of readings. So, you know, every so often. But, you know, but if you go to the GP practice and you have a one off raised blood pressure, then actually it's really important to check it at home twice a day, two readings twice a day for a week and average out those readings, because that's a more accurate way of working out if your blood pressure is normal or not than a one off white coat hypertension type reading at the GP practice. So it, it sort of varies. Um, yeah. So whether you're really fit, whether it's normal or whether, you know, you're sort of teetering on the brink of high blood pressure. And then Noreen has asked a question here, Claire, um, about I'm not sure if you've seen it, but she's wondering if there's anything that she can do to reverse her CVD. She's 69. She was um, diagnosed with um, uh, CVS X 15 years ago, told by a cardiologist, nothing to worry about. She's taking statin and BP meds daily. Um, is there anything she can do to reverse her CVD? Yeah, so it's really, so obviously I don't know how bad it was or what the situation was to know whether it, it can be reversed because I need a bit more history. But 
I mean, certainly if your blood pressure is managed, if your cholesterol is low, if you're doing all the things we've been talking about, you're exercising, you're not smoking, you're not drinking to excess, you're eating a good diet, then you can absolutely keep, you know, cardiovascular disease may never darken your door again. Um, but I can't say exactly without knowing a tiny bit more. That'd be something to maybe go to the GP and talk about with your history and numbers in front of them. And and then we have a few questions on HRT, which I'll come to, but a very timely question is, um, as we're talking about blood pressure, is uh, a great question from Leslie. Um, is hypertension the same as high blood pressure? Yeah, no, that is a good question. So yes, hypertension is a pathologically high blood pressure. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. So a question I know you often get, Claire, is um, how do you know when to stop taking HRT? Oh, yeah, it's a really good question because there isn't a really good answer to that. So um, you can t I always say you can take HRT for as long as you want to take it for, as long as you appreciate that really small risk of breast cancer year on year. We know in the early years, the benefits definitely outweigh the risks. And the honest answer is we just don't know how that ratio changes as you increase in years through your 60s and 70s and beyond. Um, I So some women will say to me, I'm going to take HRT till I retire, then I'm going to stop it. I have had women say, right, I've retired, I'm now taking HRT. Um, it, often women will feel they've got to a really good place in their life and they're going to just try stopping it. We know on average that menopause symptoms last about eight years on average-ish. So some women will wait till they say their late 50s and then dip their toe into reducing the dose and stopping it and see if symptoms start to recur. So it's really difficult to give a good answer to that. It's so individual. individual. Yeah. 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 Um, Karen here uh, has, uh, again, a question I know you often uh, often get, Claire. Uh, she says she's tried all of the various HRT available. Nothing's worked. Should she still continue with HRT because of other benefits? If it's not helping her with symptoms, are there other benefits? Yeah, so that I mean, there are other benefits that we've spoken about in, in terms of risk of heart disease and, osteo and osteoporosis, so thinning of the bones. But I think we sort of have to stick to the guidance and say, look, if it really hasn't helped you, then I would not take it just for disease prevention, but I would really look hard at lifestyle factors to keep those risks of osteoporosis and heart disease as low as you can and you maybe want to revisit hrt if, you know it, it's not a static set in stone rule you know things change symptoms change with time yeah and and claire i don't know if this question is for you or nigel but a great question here from dana is there a link between perimenopause and fatty liver disease <laughs> Yeah, I'll answer it from my bit and then I'm sure Nigel will have an answer too. Um, not necessarily, but if you are putting a lot of weight on in the menopause, the weight that you see around your um, on the outside, sort of around your middle, you will also have fat starting to um, cluster around the vital organs like the liver and the liver can be replaced. The liver tissue can be replaced by fat. So I would say only if you're waiting gain, gaining weight. I haven't seen a study that links loss of estrogen with fatty liver. Nigel, have you got? Yeah, no, this visceral fat, this horrible brown fat that wraps around those organs. This is really different from the sort of fat that you you lay down on, um, just under your skin when you're a lot younger. This visceral fat is the stuff that causes um, fatty liver and uh, it's it's horrid but again you can get rid of it yeah. you can absolutely uh, reverse that um, uh, but again I think it's really important this is why you know it's so good to do these things um, as a as a threesome um, you know you could do that just with diet on its own or you could do it just with exercise on its yeah. own but flipping heck it's hard you yeah. have got to do a bit of all of it to really make a difference, you know? And the beauty is if you do do a bit of all of it, 
you haven't got to work really, really hard at any of it. You just mm. actually start tweaking and adjusting little bits as you go. And the next thing you know, you know, 18 months down the line, flip and heck, look at me, I'm Wonder Woman. You've done it all. Um, and it's amazing. So um, give it time. That's the other mm. lovely thing. Mm. You know, nowadays, um, you're you're going to live into your mid 80s and 90s, at least, probably. You've got bags of time to get this right. So don't think it's all got to be done by Christmas. Yes. Just start building on it slowly. I always think, you know, give yourself at least 12 months for Project You. Yeah. And what you can achieve in that time is huge. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant advice, Nigel. And I'm conscious we've got more questions coming in. We've only got about five minutes left. Okay. So if you, n n n and, but this one I think might be for you, um, uh, or, or, or Claire, um, from Anita. Thank you, Anita, for your question. And Teresa, I should say, thank you for sharing your story too. You mentioned that cardiovascular disease linked to gut uh, and gut health. Um, um, Anita has uh, digestive diseases and pain. Are there any other symptoms of this type? I know there's a huge amount of thinking um, around gut health um, and, and, and symptoms and, and and general health. Yeah, no, so it, it's sort of, we were thinking digestion type pain um, as a sign of cardiovascular disease. Um, there's a lot of work um, going on around the gut and the biome. And I, I have to say, it's not an area that I'm a specialist in to know, but except to say there is, I'm sure Nigel may, will know more than I am, um, emerging evidence of the importance of the whole microbiome of the gut in reducing the risk of all all sorts of diseases, including heart disease. Um, Nigel, do you have any more insight than yeah. I do? Quick thing I would say is, look, you know, I'm constantly asked about supplements that you ought to be taking. If there is a bit of sensible advice, pretty much anyone living a 21st century life is probably giving their microbiome, their gut bacteria, a good kicking. It will struggle in the life that we live at the moment. If you want to try a supplement, one thing you could really give a good go to is a good quality probiotic. There are a couple free I could recommend. One is called Optibac. That's just as a little capsule you would take. One is called Simprove. That's a water-based liquid, obviously a water-based liquid, um, <laughs> a liquid probiotic and the other one is called vsl number three comes as a powder you can dilute it in water or sprinkle it over your food um all three of those good quality do what they're meant to do they cannot hurt you there are no contraindications to take them and literally um you know really sensible thing to try nigel could you do us a favor and maybe t put those in the chat so, so that everybody gets the spelling yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, if, they're, if they're um going to have a, a look online or in the shops to see where, where they can get them as i'm scrolling down through i would say uh, sue i think i would say for all of us our sincere condolences i'm so mm. sorry to hear about your ex-sister-in-law like you know i'm 56 few of us are here um that is no age so really 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 sorry to hear that and I think it just calls out. It's brilliant that everyone's on the on, on, on the webinar this evening because hopefully you leave the session this evening with the knowledge of what the signs of a heart attack are. And when you're speaking to your doctor, if you're not happy with the with the advice or the feedback you're getting, as Claire said, go in and proactively ask the questions now, now that you know what's going on. And we've given you the links from my menopause center for British Heart Foundation around heart disease. So so please use them. But we're so sorry to hear that. Our, our, our sincere um, condolences. Um, just looking here as we enter our last couple of minutes. Um, Karen, thank you for your feedback. Uh, you just commenting on it's difficult if you've had depression from some years in fibromyalgia. Confusing as your GP will sometimes palm these symptoms as the con two uh, conditions and has given up uh, assisting with that with HRT. So um so look I, I know that can be very challenging i know we can't go into individual um in, in individual issues that people uh, that people have but claire any kind of general thoughts in terms of people we've had this a, a few times if people are struggling with hrt is yeah, it worth it, assisting should they go back and speak to their doctor 
Yeah, it can be really challenging because, um, you know, through the menopause, we know depression can worsen. We know fibromyalgia symptoms can worsen as well. And, it, you know, that can really make you feel in stuck. And HRT is great, but it has side effects. It can be difficult to get HRT by itself to help with those two conditions that are worsening. Um, and, and thank you, um, Emma, as well, for your comment about, you know, HRT for antidepressants taking you to a bad place. Some brains are just, we don't know why, susceptible to side effects from HRT. Progesterone in particular um, can make some women feel really depressed. And so it's really fascinating. It's the same it's the same symptom that women will say, I felt like there was a black cloud hanging over my head. Totally unconnected patients will say the same thing. And, and we just don't know why that happens to some women. And then some women absolutely love taking it, feel amazing. It's just that I know there's research going on at the moment. So my general comment was, yeah, that it is really challenging, but it's looking to talking therapies it's looking to what movement you can make um it's looking to what diet tweaks you can make it's looking at the whole picture there isn't just going to be one thing that helps it will be a number of really small factors starting small and then just working but don't underestimate cognitive behavioral therapy particularly mm. for those symptoms great shout claire and um, good tea up because next month we'll be doing an event about cognitive behavioral therapy with Claire and a CBT expert. So look out for that invite because it is incredible just how much CBT can help with physical and me me mental health symptoms um, as well. So we're, we're into our last minute. If we can take two very quick questions, Nigel, I'm going to put one to you and one to Claire. Um, um, Nigel, if uh, do you have any recommendations for Anne? And Claire, I'll, I'll pass on Anita's question to you if you want to have a quick look at it. Um, Anne takes Omega 369. What dose would you recommend? I was just typing the answer. I would, um, I'll carry on typing, but we really don't actually have a daily um, requirement or, uh, or figure to aim for. So the serving that we look for is one serving of fish a week. All I would say is if you're taking an omega-3, 6 and 9, I'd be more inclined to just take an omega-3 and take a, a one a day capsule. You don't need to be taking the 3, 6 and 9 together. Just take the 3. I'll carry on typing. Thank you, Nigel. Claire, over to you. Um, so in answer to Anita and the risk of PPIs and um, heart disease. So PPIs are proton pump inhibitors stay, taken for gastritis and reflux. There is some evidence linking them to heart disease in the long term. But before you stop it, if you are taking it, I'd have a chat with your doctor. Look at where you are now in terms of risk and actually think what the PPI is treating, because that might put you at greater risk if you stop it than that small risk. It's a bit of an unknown area, but there is indication of risk. Super, thank you. Well, look, with that, it's 2029. Um, we're, we, so it's time to draw um, the conversation to a close. Thank you so much to Claire, to Mel and to Nigel. That was absolutely fantastic. I think we've all learned a huge amount from our conversation. And the questions were amazing. I think they really drew out so many different aspects, so much real life, and hopefully everybody's benefited from hearing everybody else's um, questions as well. And I think Teresa's comment summed, summed it up really nicely. Every woman's experience of the menopause really is unique to her. So it is about understanding what's going on with you, educating yourself, and what's going on with you is not necessarily going to be what's going on, on with your friends. So you know, put yourself first because you're worth it. And I'd say with that, thank you so much. And I'll hand over to Aideen, who I'm also going to pin now uh, to close the evening. Yes, uh, thank you. Another great event as always. So thank you very much. And thanks for all the wonderful advice. And as you said, Helen, thanks to you and Dr. Claire and to Nigel Denby and Mel Berry for this evening. And as always, thank you very much to all the Restless members who've joined us too. And for all the amazing questions. And if any of you would like further information or would like to speak to the experts, please feel free to contact hello at mymenopausecenter.com. Um, following the event, you'll all receive a link to the recording in case you'd like to watch it again or share it with friends. Um, and on that, thank you again. Good night and enjoy the rest of your evenings. Good night. Bye -bye.
Thank Goodbye, you. Everybody. Bye. Thanks, Aideen. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.